This is Irene Findlayson on Tuesday the 29th of April 2019 interviewing Carolyn Greet for the Cheltenham Local History Oral History Project. Carolyn, I know you're not a native of Cheltenham so could you please tell us something about what brought you here and what the experience has been like? Well, I came to Cheltenham in September 1963 to take up a job teaching English at Pates Grammar School for Girls, which was then in Albert Road. It's the building currently occupied by Pitville School. I'd been brought up in Birmingham and I'd done my degree and teaching diploma at Durham University. But when I started looking for jobs, I concentrated on places in the Midlands and South, though definitely not Birmingham. I had interviews at various different places, but when I came for one here, I'd never actually been to Cheltenham before, I decided I liked the look of it enough to accept the job offer. The town was far less big and dirty than Birmingham, but it was near enough for me to visit my parents there. For accommodation, I put an advert in the Echo, to which I had a lot of replies. I sorted out half a dozen possible addresses, then in August I came for a few days with a friend who had a car, and we went round them. I eventually went to a house in Pressbury Road, which was only a few minutes from the school, though I stayed there only one year. Originally, I'd intended to stay in Cheltenham for a couple of years, but after one, I realised I was only just starting to learn the job. Then I acquired a car, and once I'd started exploring the area, I didn't want to leave, so I ended up staying for years. The headmistress then was Miss Lambrick, universally known as Floss, whose ideas could sometimes be a bit tricky to deal with, such as her insistence that before school concerts, the orchestra should not do all that messy tuning up, as she called it. The school being just on the edge of the race course, Gold Cup Week caused problems, not so much the traffic as the noise. Their PA system made teaching in rooms on that side of the building really very difficult, as did the numerous low-flying helicopters, which then used to land in the central area of the race course. The Queen Mother came to the races every year, and all the girls and staff had to line the road outside the gates and wave as she passed. One year, the palace was somehow persuaded to have her stop and receive some flowers. These were carefully chosen to match her pink outfit. However, as the school uniform included a scarlet jersey, and the child chosen to make the presentation had flaming orange hair, the result was a horrible clash of colours. In the 1960s, the place for youngsters was the Blue Moon Club above a shop on the high street. Now, as Lambrick was convinced that girls would get up to no good there, and she tried to persuade me and another young member of staff to go there one evening, note which of the Pates girls were there, and report back to her. Well, I'm glad to say we both refused to go and spy for her. Girls were perfectly entitled to go if they wanted. The school building itself looked very pleasant from outside, But for some reason, the architect had thought it a good idea to have all the corridors open to the weather. This meant that in winter, every time a classroom door was opened, a bitter draught came in, and of course the heat escaped. Snow was a problem too, drifting in against the doors. I remember several accidents of people slipping on the slush and ice. Corridors were eventually glassed in, much to everyone's relief, and presumably the heating bills were much reduced. Rumours and suggestions about the reorganisation of secondary education in Cheltenham were circulating throughout the 60s and 70s, but it it was not until the mid-1980s that this took place. The the two grammar schools both closed, all staff contracts were terminated, then a new mixed school, the present Pates Grammar School, was formed. The boys had left their Victorian site in the High Street back in the mid-1960s, and were now in newish and extremely badly built premises on Princess Elizabeth Way. These were used for part of the new school, the rest being accommodated in the the old Monkscroft Secondary School building below Coronation Square. It's now the site of the Gloucestershire College. The final weeks before the move were extremely busy. It was very complicated emptying one building and moving so much across town while still teaching at Albert Road and trying to sort out an incredible number of details for the new school. It was managed eventually, though the new term had to be delayed by a couple of days. 
and most staff spent the last days of their holiday setting up desks and sorting equipment and arranging books. The split site meant that both staff and pupils often had to walk between sites between lessons. Now, this meant a complete revamp of lesson times to allow time for this. Also, because initially there was considerable antagonism among local residents because their children had had to move from the old Monkscroft building. Uh, they went to Pitville to help form the new comprehensive there. Uh, the Pates pupils had to move between sites only in largish groups for their safety. The new school was co-ed, which was quite a change for some of the staff, not to say a shock. Actually, I far preferred teaching mixed classes, especially the 13 to 14 year olds. What did not help was that, that that same year saw the replacement of the old O-level exams by the new GCSEs. Suddenly we had an entirely new method of teaching. In the English department we did the coursework only option, no exams or assessment by teachers, which is extremely time consuming. They're actually a lot more interesting for both teachers and pupils. I taught at the new school for five years, then I took early retirement having stayed for 28 years rather than the two I'd originally intended. Well, Cheltenham itself has, I suppose, changed much in the nearly 60 years since I came. GCHQ was still then partly at the Oakley site and, of course, was never mentioned by name. If asked, someone worked for the Foreign Office. It was only really in the 1980s, with the row over the unions being banned there, which caused a lot of kerfuffle in the town, that its cloak of secrecy began to lift. The town's expanded a lot. At one time, I sometimes went for lunch at the Cross Hands pub on Chicksby Road. That was in the 1970s, and then it was still well outside the build up, built-up area. I remember a donkey in the field next door to it. As for the shops in the centre of town, in the 1960s, Cavendish House still had its Edwardian frontage, a very cramped and inconvenient interior. The food department was up at the High Street end, where the cheese counter was manned by a Polish man who always had a pile of Polish papers on sale. There were a lot of Poles still in the town after the war then. The part of the shop that's now the menswear section was known as the Octagon Court and it sold furniture, I think mostly antique. The restaurant was on the first floor and mannequins would parade round the tables holding little cards with prices on I was friends with another of the young teachers, and occasionally after school we'd go and have tea and a cake there, partly I admit to giggle at all the well-dressed ladies politely sipping their tea. There are plenty of small individual shops in the centre then, most of which went long ago. There was a butcher's in the Strand which had a game licence. I never liked going past a row of pheasants and rabbits hanging head down outside, their heads in little bags. A large old-fashioned department store, Wards, stood on the corner of North Street and the High Street, opposite Boots, the site where Primark is now. Further down, on the corner of Henrietta Street, was the Old Fleece Hotel, next to the Victorian Boys' School. Behind here was the brewery, the slightly sickly smell from the maltings pervading the area at times. There are plenty of food shops of varying kinds, Locke's Bakery, the Lloyd's Bakery shops, there were a couple of fishmongers, a general grocers down opposite the ladies' college that sold items that in the 1960s were relatively unusual, and there were several greengrocers. Before the Regent Arcade was built, that area was an enormous car park. Originally, it had been the yard for the Plough Hotel on the High Street, the oldest hotel in the town. At the back of the car park, where later BHS was, there was a garage which in the early 1970s was turned into an indoor market. The car park, like others in the centre, briefly became a trust the motorist one. Drivers were supposed to put sixpence in a machine to park. Uh, unfortunately, it soon became clear that the motorist couldn't be trusted. So for a short time, parking changed to the disc system, as in France. Shops provided a disc free. You set the time you came and were allowed an hour or so free parking. That didn't last long either. After that, we had a period of parking machines on the streets, for which one never had the correct change. Parking in Cheltenham's always been a nightmare. Later in the 1980s, we had the ill-fated Noddy train, which made its way slowly round the town so that people could get on and off at will. 
In practice, it simply clogged up the centre even more. After a public vote, it was scrapped. There were several cinemas in the town when I first came, the main ones being the Odeon, with its Art Nouveau frontage in Winchcombe Street, and the Regal at the bottom of the prom. The Everyman Theatre was soon to lose its by then dated 1950s frontage and be rebuilt in the original 1890s style. The place where the very well attended children's theatre group and productions took place was the old bakery behind the library. Very cramped and inadequate, but they did some excellent work, largely thanks to the inspirational Sheila Manda. Some larger scale productions were done at the Shaftesbury Hall, part of the training college then, now the Chelsea Court Flats. Other odd details recollected from my earlier days here including, include the rather sad figure of the middle-aged woman with blonde hair who walked around the high street in a long pink satin dress pushing a pram full of small white dogs. On a rather different note, in I think 1968, the Lindsay Anderson film If was filmed mostly at the boys' college as it then was. A lot of local people took part as extras, including one or two of our staff, who were supposedly parents at a speech day. I believe they were all machine gunned at the end, only in the film. One building that was new in the 1960s was the Eagle Star headquarters in Thurston Road. When I arrived in Cheltenham, people kept saying to me, have you seen our ghastly new skyscraper? Well, I'd come from Birmingham. I was used to blocks of flats at least twice as high and four times as ugly. I really couldn't see why they were complaining about what I considered quite a nice smallish building. After living for a year in Presbury Road, I moved to a flat in Clarence Square. This was a very pleasant area and I could use the big central garden, but a slight drawback was the proximity of the black and white coach station in St Margaret's Road. Every Saturday at about two o'clock, a great fleet of coaches swept out, clogging up the roads around. I then moved to Parabola Road, a little less convenient for school, but pretty easy for shopping. I liked Montpellier. It was quite pricey, even in the early 1970s, but there was a post office, a greengrocer, bread shop and grocers, shops for necessities, not expensive dress shops. Summerfield's antique shop was there, but hardly ever open. He was very much a law unto himself. If he didn't like the look of you, he'd refuse to sell. I did manage to buy a couple of very minor items. After his death in 1989, sale of his massive accumulation of stuff lasted for many days, both here and in London. Incidentally, my rent for a large, unfinished five-room flat in Montpellier was £8 per week. By the mid-1970s, I wanted a house with a garden, so I moved out to Bishop's Cleeve where I bought a cottage with a small garden. It still was a village, just as very few of the huge new estates there had been built, though there was periodic talk of a bypass. On the right-angled corner of Evesham Road was Gilda's farm. Now, my cottage was opposite the paddock next to it, and I loved watching the varied animals there, usually sheep, sometimes cows. Sometimes in early summer I'd be woken early on a Sunday morning, at about six, by a tremendous baaing as a flock of sheep were driven down the main road to the farmyard. The paddock, incidentally, was used one year as a temporary football pitch while a new one was being laid. Well, the animals obviously had to be removed first, but I believe visiting teams used to complain loudly about the state of the pitch. There was a very small butcher shop attached to the farm, and on Saturday mornings there'd be a plate of cooked sausages to sustain those waiting in the queue. The village didn't then have its Tesco, but the range of small shops supplied everything, that actually it still does. There was an animal feed mill on the Tesco site. Though there were and are plenty of activities in the village, I didn't join any of them as I was quite involved already with mostly musical activities elsewhere. I joined Gloucester Choral Society soon after coming to Cheltenham. Uh, my neighbour in the staff room offered to take me when she knew I was interested. And later I joined the Bar Choir and Music of Vera and sang occasionally with other groups in and around Cheltenham. In my mid-forties, I married, and we moved back into central Cheltenham. From then on, I became involved more in local history, and my husband was one of the founders, with Stephen Blake, of the Cheltenham Local History Society, and he also started a Cheltenham King's Local History Society. 
It's only looking back that I realised just how many changes there have been since I came all those years ago. But I must say, I've never regretted choosing Cheltenham. Carolyn, thank you. That was a very interesting and vivid account of your time here. It's still flashing, so...